Oh. Thank you very much. Welcome to a jam toast collaboration. <laughs> I think it's fair yeah. to say. Um, I'm sure. I'm Alana. And we will be discussing one of the big events in November for history, which is uh, Remembrance Sunday, which marks the end of the First World War, but also incorporates um, the memories of those who lost their lives during the First World War and the Second World War, and has now roughly taken up to those who've lost their lives in all wars uh, across the world. We are here, joined with John Sibler, who is the head of history at City and Islington College. John, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, for this little chat. Um, yes, I'm uh, the head of history. Uh, I've been teaching here uh, for 19 years at City and Islington, uh, but before that I've also taught um, in other places, in Australia, in Malawi, in, in uh, rough inner city schools, let's say. Uh, so I've been teaching for 29 years uh, altogether. Uh, but in the last few years, I've also been doing a uh, PhD at Birkbeck College uh, after college, uh, which has been really hard work. Uh, but I'm studying the uh, representation of African and Caribbean servicemen uh, in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. Um, so I know a little bit about the topic of remembrance and memory um, and memorials and, and that's what I've, I've been studying as well and um, I've also produced work on black history uh, for the National Archives and the British Library um, you know and I've had chapters and books published and I've been on television and radio uh, so forth. Thank you, thank you very much for joining us. Um, my first question is what, what does Remembrance Sunday mean to you? Well, that's a really good question. I think because it's such a big event, not just nationally, but internationally, um, I could put the question back to you. What do you think about in those two minutes? Do you really think about war or do you think about your shopping or, or whatever? It's a very interesting, um, and there have been studies on this uh, by Mass Observation. Uh, which is an organisation in Britain that used to just record uh, people's thoughts about different things. Um, but in terms of my own thoughts, uh, they change over time. I think like a lot of people, when I, when I was young, I really did try to think about war. But of course, the image of war comes from what you know about those wars. And the First World War, all I knew about were the trenches and the Western Front and poppies. And so you try and remember those things. Um, but as time goes on, um, and you're asked to remember, you start questioning, why am I being asked to remember? What do you want me to remember? Do you want me to remember a particular uh, way of, 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 of remembering war? So the meaning of Remembrance Sunday has kind of changed for me over time. Uh, and where I'm at at the moment is I think I'm contesting who or what we are remembering, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point uh, that you make about who uh, it's about remembering. And we'll get onto that a little bit later on. Um, yeah. Um, do you think Remembrance Sunday is more about remembering the horror of the war and the honouring the soldiers, or do you see it more as gra glamorising war? Okay. Um, so Remembrance Sunday has been with us for just over 100 years. And I think that when it first started, if, if you read the history of it, uh, the first uh, official one, there was a kind of an unofficial one um, in, in 1919, but in 1920, it was the first state ceremonial around uh, Armistice Day. And at that time, there were literally millions of people who in some way had lost someone, uh, whether it be their son, or their husband, or a brother, or uh, even a sister, um, and people were very emotionally affected by the war. They were traumatised, and loss often takes many years to recover from. And I think that in that period, I mean, for example, the history of the cenotaph comes about because in 1919 there's a kind of victory march, and they build a temporary cenotaph made of wood, and they put it in the middle of Whitehall, 
but the day before uh, and in the days afterwards, literally hundreds of thousands of people laid tributes because they needed closure or they needed to put um, some kind of object or, or to even touch an object that would bring them closer to the person they've lost. Because unlike other countries, Britain made a decision not to repatriate its war dead. So wherever they were killed, that's where they were buried. Uh, whereas, for example, the United States, they made a big effort to remove the bodies back to the United States uh, to places like Arlington Cemetery. So for a lot of British people, unlike in most cases when someone dies, they either bury them in their local church or, or whatever it might be. Um, for almost a million people, they, they, didn't, they weren't able to see the dead body or know what happened to them. Uh, and so consequently, they needed something to, to a tangible for them to touch, to, to, to visit. And the, the clamour for a permanent memorial, like a national memorial, was so much so that they decided to build, the government decided to make a permanent cenotaph in the middle of Whitehall. And so what I'm arguing is in the first few years of the existence of the cenotaph and our missus day, it was a ceremony and a place where people could um, talk to other people, try and make some sense of the war, um, show sorrow for their loss, um, and, and it was a place of mourning. Um, but I think that what's happened is as time has passed, and as those people who fought in the war and their relatives have passed away, it's become something different, and it's become a very militaristic, nationalistic ceremony, I think, um, which is more about getting people to join the armed forces than it is about remembering the horror of war. And I think it's kind of a bit of both, let's say, but there's more glamorising war than remembering the horror of war at the moment. Uh, so that's what I think. What do you think it's changed from this um, ceremony to try and remember and have a closure of the war to this uh, glamorization of our military and this pride in having a military and a strong one at that? Okay, that, that, that's a, a good question. I, I think it happened very early on, actually. I think uh, what happened is after 1921, the government, if you like, uh, in modern-day parlance, they... Uh, privatized um, the remembrance of war. So for the traditions regarding the cenotaph and Armistice Day, they handed it over to the British Legion, who were made up of veterans, uh, but were led by people like Earl Haig, you know, who was one of the leading architects of the war, um, controversial figure, um, very militaristic, but linked to the state. And in terms of the care of the dead bodies, uh, of uh, service personnel, they handed it over to the Imperial War Graves Commission. So they're not strictly government organisations, they're kind of quasi-governmental, you know, the British Legion and the Imperial War Graves Committee. And that happened as early as the 1920s. So if you like, the government stood back, they created a, a ceremony, a tradition, an invented tradition if you like, and other groups then came in and fulfilled those roles. Um, but, so those so who, who, how can we, the public, influence military veterans in the British Legion? How can we, as the members of the public who may have lost people in those wars, influence the Imperial War Graves Commission? We can't really. Um, they kind of, they have a specific job, a specific role, and they've been doing that for, for almost a uh, hundred years. Um, I think what happens is, and I'll use the Iraq War uh, as an example, um, what, which uh, you had two uh, wars in the, in the 90s and, and the noughties. And what you'll find is when there's a war on, the government of the day wants people to get behind the government and get behind the war effort. So all of a sudden, military traditions are even more um, in people's uh, faces than they would normally be. Um, 
every year you can tick off, you know what's going to happen on the 11th of, of, of November or the Sunday closest to it. But when there's a war on, there's more made of the uh, First World War and the Second World War and the Korean War or, or, or whatever war conflicts that British forces have been involved in. So I think in, in the modern day, in, in your memory and in my memory, um, it depends if there's a war on and for, at the moment, although Britain isn't directly involved in uh, Ukraine, you can see the, how they would use a military cer ceremony like Armistice Day to, to gather support for the British political position on, on what it's doing over Ukraine. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I'm in a um, pipe band and we recently went on a parade uh, for Remembrance Sunday and it is one of the biggest turnouts we remember ever having. And I wonder now if that is to do with the Ukrainian war. Um, is, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, who Remembrance Sunday is about remembering. Is Remembrance Sunday inclusive of all ethnicities who've served in the armed forces? What do you think? Well, it, it, it's, that's a good question. Um, at the time of the First World War, Britain was an empire, was at the head of the largest empire the world had ever seen. So when you were saying, was it inclusive at the time of its inception? The answer is partially, because um, in what happened during the First World War, which hadn't happened before, uh, in the Boer War, there were volunteers from parts of the empire, especially Australia, New Zealand, um, and Canada. But during the First World War, I think it's fair to say that Britain could quite easily have lost the war if it wasn't for the empire, and in particular the Indian Army, uh, which sent 1.3 million service personnel to, to help with war effort in different theatres. Also the Canadians, also the Australians, also the uh, you know, the Anzacs, the Australians and the New Zealanders, also South Africans. Uh, and they all suffer terribly in, in one way or another. But I argue in my PhD that only three parts of the empire are remembered. Britain, and that's Scotland, Ireland, Wales, first, at the top of a hierarchy, a, a kind of memorial hierarchy. Then you, you have the white dominions, as they were called, which is the South Africans, Australians, New Zealanders and Canadians. And then at the bottom of this kind of tripart hierarchy, I argue, you have the Indians. And this would be the first time that Indians are remembered. Um, but you live in London. Do you see memorials to Indians in the First World War around London? Probably not. Um, but you can see memorials to Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders and so forth. And you can certainly see um, uh, memorials to, 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 to the British war effort, uh, especially in London. Uh, London was seen as the ceremonial part of, of the empire. Um, but I argue that the colonial subjects, such as from the Caribbean, um, South African Native Labour Corps, Chinese Labour Corps, let's say, but especially uh, people who are called porters or labourers or um, the, these people, um, carriers, they're called, they carry the weapons in, in East Africa and West Africa. These people have not been remembered at all. And I call the statues and memorials around London the memorial landscape. I challenge you to go to the centre of London and look at the memorial landscape and see how many memorials there are to Africans in the First World War. Uh, and we're talking about 300,000 being killed in the First World War, supporting the British against the German colonial forces. Uh, and they're not in the memorial landscape in Britain, nor in Africa, on the African continent itself, in East Africa, uh, in West Africa and so forth. Their names at best might be there, but you won't actually see memorials to them. Um, so what you're seeing is at the time, there was no invitation, uh, starting with the Victory Parade in 1919, Black soldiers were not invited to the Victory Parade in 1919. And that parade was the precedent for future parades 
in future wars. And so if they've been excluded from that, that means they'll be excluded forevermore because that is a tradition of exclusion uh, set up. Um, so the, the, this is my thing. But, but what you're seeing now in the present day is you are seeing an attempt to include more ethnicities in our Mistress Day parades. But perhaps I'm being cynical here, but I think the British Army is short of soldiers. Uh, and secondly, it has to have a certain quota of ethnic minorities. So it needs to fill them. And, it, and people, very simply, African and Asian people in Britain are not rushing to join the British Army. Um, I think because it has a history of prejudice. And so consequently, they're having to go to like Nepal or the Caribbean or to Fiji uh, for, for, for soldiers. And then that they, they're who you're seeing <laughs> represented. And they talk about a, a united Commonwealth. But actually, it, it kind of disguises a, a story of lack of recruitment of, of black people in the British Armed Forces. Um, what, how do you think, in your view, what do you think is the right way to start including ethnicities who served in the First World War, for example, into British history? Is it through textbooks? Is it by building more cenotaphs? How do you, how do you think is the best way to incorporate this forgotten history? I think, I think you're right. I think you have to start from the present and you have to educate uh, the modern generation about the true nature of the First World War, the Second World War, whatever it might be. Um, so education is an important tool in all of that. Um, is it important to include them in the memorial landscape? Yes, it is. Um, um, I, I, there's a big debate in society, for example, I don't know if you watch Bridgerton on, on, on Netflix, but they have what's called colourblind casting. So we're talking about the 18th century, but you have black characters, you know, as lords of the manor or whatever it might be. And a lot of people find that uncomfortable. But in this case, we're talking about things that actually happened. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, including up to a million Africans in East Africa, West Africans, East Africans, serving in the First World War who have never had a memorial built to them. In fact, they spent all their efforts ensuring that there wasn't a memorial built for them. There were three statues put up. But that was in lieu of what you see on the Western Front, which are thousands upon thousands of graves and headstones. Um, there was never any intention to give headstones uh, to Africans. So I, I do think they need to do that. I, they, there is evidence, and I've uncovered it as well as other historians, that when Africans died, they knew where their bodies were, and some of them were even buried in the cemeteries, and they know where their bodies are in the cemetery but they still won't give them a headstone. And I think there needs to be a campaign, and I don't know how many decades that will take. But if you want true equality, then that's what needs to happen, because in the future, when you and I are on this planet, people will visit these war cemeteries, and if they don't see Africans or, 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 or native South Africans, as they were called, or, or uh, Caribbeans there, then they will think they didn't take part in the war and their memory then will be of a white war, or at best a, a, an Indian and Australian and, and British war, but they won't see it. So you can have a page in a textbook, and that's good, but how many people study history? You know, and as you go on uh, to GCSE and A-level, the numbers get smaller and smaller, uh, and there aren't really a lot of books about this in the public domain. So I think permanent memorials that people can see are very, very important. And as I said, I challenge you again to tell me where you can see a war memorial to the black contribution in the First World War, apart from in Brixton, where people had to pay for one uh, to, and, and create it themselves, which they put outside um, black cultural archives in, Brist in Brixton. But that's the only one I know of. It's, yeah, it's such an important point to remember all the ethnic minorities who really were important in this war. Do you think today, with the emergence of a white poppy versus the red poppy, do you know anything about that, or what do you think? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, well, this has always been the contested nature of memory, 
you know, it's like we have a little thing going, oh, I didn't remember that. And you go, yeah, do you remember when? Uh, and, and it's the same uh, with the First World War. Uh, people are contesting that it was a kind of white only war or that it was an important war or a necessary war. And so that's why you get the white poppy movement um, before the set between the wars, really, between the First World War and the Second World War. And you have the League of Nations uh, organizing peace plebiscites, as they call, call, where they're asking people of every nation to vote whether they should abolish war. Because the war was so horrible, the First World War, and so catastrophic compared to anything that had happened previously that people genuinely did not want another war again and were surprised that 20 years later they were involved in another war. So there had been these huge pacifist movements in the 1920s, many involving veterans who served in the war. Um, and I remember even recently the very last Tommy, as they called him, the person, the last surviving serviceman from the First World War, Harry, Harry Patch, he was against war. He said, war is horrible. There should never, ever be war. Um, and people should listen to the people who fought in those wars, the veterans, not to their governments, you know, who, who, who often start wars for political purposes. Um, we should listen to people who fought in wars themselves. And their wars, their experience of war, their emotions of war, their memories of war are very traumatic. So um, people should be aware that both after the First World War and after the Second World War, especially during the Cold War, where at the push of a button, the whole world could be destroyed many times over. There was the growth of the campaign for nuclear disarmament, uh, which was linked to earlier pacifist movements. And when it, even in the Iraq War, one of the biggest demonstrations in British history has been over two million people marching in London uh, against uh, British involvement in, in the Iraq War. So there have been these huge pacifist movements. So what I think is that if people want to wear white poppies, they're upholding a tradition. They're not being brave or, or necessarily radical. They're just being, they've just made a, a sensible choice that if they're going to remember war, the way they want to remember it is that there should never be another war uh, again, which is why they wear white ones, because they believe the red poppy, which started off as a, I think, um, a quite important way of raising money for people who've been injured in war and to try and find jobs for them and to help pay for their treatment and re rehabilitation. I think that has been lost now. That's the original meaning of the red poppy. Uh, and it's become, as I said, very militaristic, uh, very government, um, top-down focus rather from the bottom up. So I'd like to see people wearing both, really, um, uh, red poppies and, and, and white poppies. There are even black poppies now uh, for people who believe that the black contribution has been forgotten. And in Asia, they have the brown poppy, <laughs> uh, where they feel that there isn't enough attention paid uh, to the Indian contribution, in uh, the Asian contribution in, in the first and the second world wars. So I, don't, I think what I'd like to see is where people feel free to remember the war how they wish, without being pressured, if you like, to just wear one of those. I think there should be a range. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, and you were talking about the sort of difference and shift in opinions on war through generations. Do you think remembrance is changing as a concept throughout the generations or that today the younger people might see it in a different way to? Yeah, I, th I think they're trying to present war as now, or the memory of the last hundred years of wars and conflicts as, as being like one big family involved in, in, in a war and um, what young people need to know is that it wasn't one big family there were some members of the family who weren't even allowed in the house um, and and so there has to be a bit more uh, honesty about uh, the first world war uh, even the second world war um, and um, you know who, who who we are remembering uh, and who we were allowed to remember um, I, I like the more inclusive uh, nature of the ceremonies, um, but I think the damage has been done. I still think in inventing the tradition that had its origin in exclusion, <laughs> trying to make it look more inclusive um, doesn't cut it for me. Uh, and I would like young people to know the true history of the First World War, 
uh, the nature of hierarchy and the nature of the British Empire and how that worked uh, within the British Empire, and then let them decide how uh, these ceremonies should be organised in the future. Uh, yesterday, in preparation for this, I thought of a question uh, for you, which was what you thought the future of Remembrance Sunday is going to be. Um, and I, I, I still would like you to answer that, but also, um, what is your utopia for, for this? What is What do you think should be the future of Remembrance from today? Um, two questions. Yeah. Okay. okay. If we're asked to remember things, uh, first and foremost, we should be asked not just to remember war. <laughs> there are so many other things that we could be remembering. Um, things that have gone wrong and we don't want to happen again, or things that have gone right and things that we, we can learn a lesson from. There are War isn't the only solution to the problems in, in our society. And my concern about it just kind of continuing uh, Remembrance Sunday is that we will always, young people um, in the future will always see war as, as the only option, as rather than the last option. Um, and this comes back to something you raised earlier about glamorising war. And I think that the way that they have people marching, you know, and these traditions around it, it, it it's too militaristic. You don't need the army there to remember war. You do not need the armed forces there to remember war. It should just be veterans or their families, and, and it can be a completely different uh, uh, ceremony altogether. So the whole thing for me needs to kind of redesign. Um, uh, in terms of the future, obviously, I would like for there not to be war. But if we're every year, as an important part, spending a lot of time creating a, a ceremony uh, that is, um, yeah, it effectively glamorizes war now and not, and not go through the horror of war, then that just makes that job of getting rid of war altogether much more difficult. Um, if, we, if you go back to the 20s when these ceremonies first started appearing, they used to have debates, and the most famous one is in the Oxford Union where the students voted to abolish war as a way of resolving future conflicts. Where's that happening now in this country? You know, uh, perhaps it might happen in individual schools, but it's certainly not reported in the press. It's very, very one-way traffic at the moment. So, yeah, just to end off, really, I, I hope the future will be more honest, um, you know, more, more, with, with more clarity and more contestation among people about what it is we should be remembering. just say that, yeah, I hope that this, to people who are listening to this, will really take into account, you know, the, this different perspective of war that should be more uh, understood and um, talked about, because it's definitely something that the country should not be glamorizing, and yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. Thank you very much, John. It's very good to hear <laughs> what you thought, think on this. You're welcome. And thank you to those who are listening.